Thank you, everybody. Um, when I was dragged into the airport to do the um, Ellington 70, 75th anniversary book, um, they, in great excitement, dragged me along the old um, yeah. their old offices, now the ESB building outside the airport. So yeah, we've got an archive. And we walked down the corridor, and a very anonymous door, uh, which led into what I can only describe as a broom cupboard. Uh, and their archive consisted of a big pile of posters, <coughs> um, a cupboard that had in it their staff magazine, and that was pretty much it. Apart from in the corner, beautifully wrapped up, back from the um, dry cleaners, every uniform type that had ever been worn by a stewardess back from 1936 all the way through to now. So in everything's his mind, fashion comes first. <laughs> So what I want to do today is kind of touch on the history of Dublin Airport, and that should be Dublin Airports because there's been more than one, uh, and also build on the point that was just made, that the history of Dublin Airport, um, by virtue of planes get you places, is more than just uh, a history of kind of what's 12 miles up the road. It's also a history of Irish aviation as well. Um, I suppose in the mad feather department, uh, the first aviation flight is obviously Orville Wright, uh, in 1903 in America, uh, the first powered flight that managed to stay in the air for the massive 12 seconds. Uh, there is actually a kind of newsreel footage of it. Uh, and if you watch it, it's quite interesting. You, know, you could actually argue they never really got into the ground. They more bounced along a bit. Um, but it was recorded at 12 seconds. And I think the one thing that strikes you when you start looking at the history of aviation is just the rapid speed of development. Uh, mainly brought about by the two world wars, are absolutely critical in forcing aviation ahead. But in the idea of just <clears throat> rapid development and the rapid spread of that fanciful idea of flying, um, 1903 Orville Wright, um, it only takes six years until Ireland has its first flight, its first powered flight in... Thank you. Uh, first powered flight in 1909, um, undertaken by Harry Ferguson of the Ferguson Tractor family, um, who in um, the June of that year, in 1909, founded the Irish Aero Club on Dawson Street. Such was the enthusiasm amongst people to build their own planes and to try and fly them. Um, but good old Harry did get there first, uh, built his own plane, it's a terrifying idea, the idea you're going to build something that doesn't just go along the ground, it actually goes up and could come spectacularly down as well. Um, but he flew that at Hillsborough uh, on New Year's Eve 1909, um, flying for a massive 130 yards. Um, but the progress was amazing. Um, in terms of it takes just another... Um, 10 years from Ferguson's 130-yard flight um, for this to happen, which you're probably familiar with, which is Olcott and Brown making the first powered flight, uh, non-stop flight across the Atlantic. Um, it's actually a competition that's put in train by the Daily Mail um, in 1906, the idea this was a holy grail that people were um, looking for. <coughs> the prize was maybe £10,000. The problem is the First World War intervenes with people's attempts to get across the Atlantic. Um, by the time we get to 1919, and the summer of 1919, there's three different groups trying to get um, from Newfoundland to Europe. And where they're going in Europe is always left as an empty, um, empty target. They just need to make a landfall somewhere. Um, <clears throat> Brown in particular had the idea that it would be best to land in London, to get all the way across um, to land in a major city. But they agreed that their first stopping off point, if they just made it and couldn't go any further, would be the Marconi station just outside Clifton. Uh, point being that Marconi's people were happy to build the necessary um, runways to grand a term, a flattened area of bog just outside Clifton. Um, but the idea then was obviously Marconi's telegraph um, station could wire the news around the world. Um, so they take 72 hours non-stop to get across the Atlantic. Uh, they come through a snowstorm, um, not, sure, uh, shy of, not far shy of Ireland. Um, unfortunately, in flying, uh, they miss the runway. The Marconi engineers are out there with lamps at 8 o'clock in the morning, this way, this way. Uh, they miss and they crash the plane. Um, the telegraph part works. The news goes round the, the world, literally, um, by mid-morning. 
which gives Rolls-Royce, who's made the engine, um, enough time to have transported to the Clifton Hotel that evening um, 48 cases of champagne. <laughs> Considering this is a two-man operation, that's quite a significant amount of drink, um, and not one bottle was left the next morning, and the people at Clifton did say it was one of the better nights in their town. What it proves is the critical positioning of islands. Sounds obvious in some ways, the kind of westernmost piece of land um, in the European continent um, in the Atlantic. But just in terms of for the speed of development of planes in terms of size, seats, distance, etc., etc., distance is the one thing that is hugely problematic. Um, and the island will become critical for the future of transatlantic aviation. And also because of Ireland's close relationship with the US, um, there's various significant and individual things that Ireland will develop in terms of transatlantic travel, which really has always held it in very good stead, uh, and for Dublin Airport particularly has put it into a critical position. <coughs> now, obviously the technology that leads to Olcock and Brown getting across um, the Atlantic is in large part driven on by what happens during the First World War. The First World War begins in 1914, uh, there is a perception, particularly in the British military mind, that this will not be an aviation war, that aviation just isn't far enough ahead. But very quickly, both in terms of surveillance, actually looking where trenches are on either side, both the Germans and the British um, go full tilt at developing aviation. Um, obviously, you have those kind of classic dogfights that are there. Um, but in particular, the British, uh, the Royal Air Forces will become, begins building... Um, runways, you're asking about grass runways at a point, um, at various locations across Britain, and obviously Ireland is still part of Britain at that point, which means runways are laid down in two locations in Dublin. Um, first of all at Baldonnell in 1917, and in Collinstown in 1918. Um, both sites were used throughout the War of Independence. Um, the RAF didn't, there's no great kind of role that's played by the RAF um, during the War of Independence, but it's the fact they're there and the aviation is still a kind of ongoing thing. It's also clear when the war ends um, in 1921 and the truce talks begins that the Irish, the new Irish state that will become, um, actually buys its first plane. Uh, specifically, it's a five seat uh, Martin side plane which is kept at Croydon during the process of the talks with the British, uh, specifically on the knowledge that if those talks fail, Michael Collins will be ghosted out of London to Croydon and flown back to Ireland, specifically so he can't be arrested. Uh, the Collins is seen as such an important player in this piece um, that, you know, before the state almost officially exists, there is a state airline or the Air Corps ready to bring him home. Uh, with the foundation of the state following the treaty, the Air Corps um, have got this choice. They can't the Irish state isn't wealthy enough to keep two, air, um, two airports going. So is it going to be, it's almost like kind of hosting the Olympic Games. You know, the host cities are Baldonnell and Collinstown. The winner is, drumroll, it's Baldonnell. Baldonnell gets the vote. Um, the reasoning seems to be it's just in better condition. Um, Collinstown, both of them at the time were very much kind of distant from the city centre. Um, but Baldonnell is the one that's chosen by the Air Corps as the home for, as it were, Dublin Airport. And Common Town very quickly from 1919 falls into disrepair, um, although still owned by the new Office of Public Works, owned by the state, um, Common Town largely returns to its agricultural usage. So the runway, as is, um, works during the Civil War, the Air Corps are there, they have 14 pilots, so you know, even for a new island, that's quite a significant venture into, at least in this case, military flying. Uh, and planes, the civil wars, again, it's not something that's been written about, if anybody who's desperate for a PhD thesis or a research interest, but planes are used during the civil war on a regular basis by the state um, for surveillance, but also particularly for large-scale droppings of propaganda leaflets into areas held by anti-treaty forces. Um, so it's quite significant, and this is where really Val Donald kind of kicks on uh, and grows. The next significant step uh, comes in 1928, um, when the German plane here, the Bremen, uh, is the first plane to successfully fly the other way across the Atlantic, i.e. east-west, 
Um, and it takes off significantly from Baldonnel. Again, this significance of where Ireland sits in the Atlantic means, you know, if you want to fly east-west, you want to start as near to America and Canada as you can. And at that point, Baldonnel is the most westerly runway uh, in Europe. Its significance in terms of not just its record-breaking east-west route, um, but its significance for Ireland in terms of the two German pilots uh, are aware that all other attempts to go east-west have failed. Some of them have failed with horrific crashes and deaths in the Atlantic. And they want somebody who's tried before. Uh, and the man they choose is the guy in the middle, is Colonel James Fitzmaurice of the Irish Air Corps. Uh, and he's their navigator. And they talk very openly uh, on their return at how critical Fitzmaurice has been to the success of the operation. What's impressive about the Bremen's flight is it's not simply they get from east-west, it's the fact they only spend two days in the US before they turn around and come back again. Um, so they go east-west, west-east. It's a kind of monumental um, issue. And the picture on the right really speaks to the excitement and the glamour of the feat, um, but also the Irish involvement in terms of Fitzmaurice, that when they return to Dublin, they are paraded through um, the city centre, and it's estimated that 150,000 people turn out to look at these three aviators who've done this incredible um, feat. And I say, again, it underscores the geographical importance of Ireland in any development of what will become commercial uh, flying across the transatlantic routes. Uh, and Fitzmaurice, in particular, critically, um, when he returns, starts hectoring the government, in other words, for it, starts hectoring the government to say, look, Commercial flying is going to be a reality. You know, we've proved it can be done along across great distances, across supposedly difficult routes. Um, you, the new Irish government, should begin investing in an Irish airline. Strange thing is, for the 1920s, although Commonwealth invested huge sums of money in building the very, very modern um, Shannon Dam and bringing about the sort of partial electrification of Ireland, they seem utterly resistant to the idea that commercial flying will have a future. Um, they dismiss it out of hand almost as a fad, um, but critically they argue that Ireland doesn't need it. The Ireland has perfectly workable, viable ferry routes across um, to Britain, but also in the, in the age of um, transatlantic steamers, Ireland is connected. Um, we can argue that is a very bad miss, but the key thing that's changed of government in 1932 is Irish, Irish aviation probably has its greatest advocate uh, in Sean Lamass. Sean Lamass got flying straight off the bat, uh, and Sean Lamass, I think in national positioning, also understood that in a world where most European countries were moving towards national airlines, Ireland needed to be at that race. Um, and Lamass becomes a great advocate for the development of what will become Aer Lingus. So on the 22nd of May 1936, finally, after about two years hard debating about rights and ownership and the functionality of the airline, Aer Lingus is founded. Um, it's a state company. This is the share certificate that's issued. Uh, it's a state-owned company, um, rather than the commercial one listed on uh, the stock market. A very specific decision made by... Um, the mass and the people at the time, it's not dissimilar, I suppose, in the way that when RTE came into being, um, the Irish government choose the sort of more the BBC model, the state owned model, rather than the American commercial model. And you get the same kind of debates around Aer Lingus that this is the national airlines about national pride, it should not be about um, private money making. So, in the end, only 12 shares are issued. Um, and it takes till 2006 until, and Aer Lingus is actually one of the last European, or one of the later European uh, national airlines to go into um, public ownership. <coughs> Obviously, we're now familiar with um, the look of Aer Lingus, the Shamrock, which has been there since the beginning. Um, the one thing I did learn when I got, did the book, um, when you look at the typeface, it says Aer Lingus. The G, next time you look at an Aer Lingus ticket or sign, the G is the only G like that in the world. It's a specific typeface invented for Aer Lingus. It's a trademark G they have, so something to be proud of. Anyway, back in 1928, um, 
It's Robert Logan, the then general manager, literally, as you can see, with his ballpoint pen and a piece of paper, scribbles out the first imagery for what will become um, the Aer Lingus uh, logo. Uh, and he writes at the time in a memo when he sends his design around that it's absolutely critical that Aer Lingus has a clear national identity. Um, and I think, again, the one thing when you look at the history of Aer Lingus, even now, is it's very, very strong on where it's from. That this is, you know, rooted in Irishness, diaspora, welcome, a whole series of messages that are there. Um, I think it's critical when uh, the British Airways holding company bought Aer Lingus uh, in the last two years, there was never any debate that Aer Lingus was going to be swallowed up and rebranded. That even British Airways and its ownership understood that on the routes it flies, kind of Aer Lingus is very clear-cut national identity is critical. So the first plane um, <coughs> that Erling is by um, is a de Havilland 84, a dragon given the name of Ulla, and registered as EIAVI, and EI is a prefix that Erling still used today. And again it's based at Baldonnell uh, and take, makes its maiden flight, the first Erling flight, on the 27th of May 1936. It's flown from Dublin to Bristol, and then on to London, uh, with five passengers and ten copies of the Irish Times. <laughs> Not a fortune to be had from ten copies of the Irish Times or five passengers, but it's the big um, development. It's a takeoff for, not just Air Lingus, but really for Baldonnell and the first Dublin airport in the commercial world. Again, what struck me when I was looking at this uh, a few years ago, was I was expecting when I went to the day afterwards newspapers, this would be the big news story. The island was in the air, Aer Lingus had been born, this is the start of the national airline. The news, day's newspapers revealed, in a way, how minor this event actually was. Um, it's also the same day that Aer Lingus starts. It's the day the ocean line of the Queen Mary makes its maiden voyage. That gets three pages. This gets half a column. Okay, I think it really said a lot about, yes, Ireland had made, like many other countries, this big step in towards um, state-owned state aircraft, and yet in the context of the late 1930s, um, ocean-going liners were still the way to travel. <coughs> so prior to World War II, and again, timing everything and Aer Lingus were unlucky, but obviously they, they launched three years before the war, and certainly the war in Europe um, kicks off. But they do, um, I love this, the ideas, the great thing about kind of going through um, the archives when I kind of found them in various places was you get so used to now doing everything on a phone or online to actually have old-fashioned timetables you could flip through, it was wonderful. But um, in those years before the war from Baldonnell, Aer Lingus flies three routes, uh, Bristol, London, Liverpool. They're the main things they do. Um, with probably talking two flights a day, maybe three. This is a very small operation. Um, but Baldonnell was the choice made back in the 1920s, but by the 1930s with this era of commercial um, thinking was a problem. Um, there was a common view that is too far out of the city centre. But when you open the timetable, not only does it tell you what time the plane's leaving, it tells you about the Lincoln bus service they have that leaves from the city centre. Um, and it adds about an extra hour and a half to allow for everything to work um, to get out to the um, airport. The terminal building um, can best be described as it's about half the size of this room uh, and you wouldn't keep pigs in it. It's shocking in its sort of basic um, facilities. And again, that's a part of evolution. It's been built as a military base, not as a commercial space. Uh, it only had four staff. Uh, there's a wonderful advert from when Aer Lingus first starts, uh, about three months before, and they're looking for the staffing. Uh, the advert describes them as an administrator, an administrative assistant, uh, an engineer, and a boy. Um, the first three do actually have job descriptions. The boy just says, general jobs on the airfield. Um, I was almost very Dickensian, the idea of some 12-year-old flagging in aeroplanes and things. But anyway, um, I was never able to find out who he was, which frustrated me. 
Um, but the whole thing, in a way, the evolution of our lingus and I suppose the problems of using a military, well, it's essentially a military air base for a commercial operation meant that something had to give. Um, so the debate starts around 1935-1936 about building a new, um, a new Dublin airport. There was a problem though. In a way, the centre of the main business of Irish aviation had shifted away from Dublin to Shannon. Um, I'm sure some of you have probably been down to Foynes, but really in that kind of four or five years running into the Second World War was the high era of the flying boat. Um, but this was an American firm, a British firm um, ran the routes, um, it was a high glamour, it was a railway, the idea that people came into Dublin from London by ferry, that they went from Dublin to Foynes by train and then they got on their flying boat and went to um, the US. But Dublin Airport was missing a link there, that the natural thing would be to fly London, Dublin, Dublin, Shannon and off you go from there. Um, and this in part informed the thinking um, about what to do or how to develop a Dublin Airport given that in an era before transatlantic jets, this was the future. Um, so some of this thinking around um, what would become Dublin Airport was informed by kind of in a way linking up with Shannon. Now the war changes that, but by the time the war ends, uh, we're well into an era we've moved away from flying boats and the war again has kind of sped up the process of technological change which changes the dynamic and pushes everything back to Dublin again. So, the options in 1936-37, um, where are we going to go? Option one um, is a disused site of Conestown. Favoured because reasonable links into the city centre, but actually it has the lowest number of fog days in the Greater Dublin area. Important if you want to build an airport, I suppose. Um, the people at Knock never figured that out. You don't need fog if you want to run an airport. Anyway, um, I always thought the more romantic but destructive option was Phoenix Park. There was a plan to <laughs> there was a plan to take the sort of the upper end of the park from Arsnoctra on out to where the M50 was now, lose half the park and build the airport there. Um, argument being, it was very easy to get to the city centre and tourists would enjoy the ride through the, what remained of the park after they'd come out of the airport. Um, the bravest idea, the biggest idea, the boldest idea, um, which obviously the Irish government ran away from because it was too bold and brave, um, was to reclaim the land on Merrion Strand. So really, if you think about where the new uh, kind of waste recycling unit is, down to the Martello, Martello Tower, that was all going to be airport, kind of floating above um, the sea. In a way, Collins Town works not simply because of lack of fog days, it's cheaper to do. Um, so, by December 1936, the decision was made to purchase the extra land they need, 700, 717 acres, um, which was bought by a combination of the state and Dublin Corporation. The state's relationship with Dublin Airport has always been a strange one, that at the time, it argued very critically that um, the Dublin Airport was an issue for Dublin Corporation. It was not a national issue, which shows a kind of again, bizarre thinking around, you think now a national airport has to be a national issue. At the time, the government was still playing a game, you don't really know where this aviation thing is going to go. If you, DCC, want to take the risk, good luck. Um, so by the end of 1937, we're still in a different age. The four grass runways are complete and work had begun on Desmond Fitzgerald's iconic, quite brilliant uh, terminal building. It's the best example, I think, of modernist um, architecture in Ireland. Um, I think it's sad in a way the airport's developed. It's kind of a bit lost now. Um, I think it's open to the public two days a year. If you ever get a chance to go, it is absolutely stupid. For all the knocking about they've done inside, the design aesthetic of the place is incredible. Um, 
It looks like a ship. The idea, Fitzgerald wrote about this, the notion that this is the power of the ship and that it's curvature, etc., etc. <coughs> and in a way, he's, it's quite interesting when he, he, he describes what he's trying to do, that he's building what's necessary areas for planes to park up, um, but has also conceived it uh, within that dominant thinking of the ocean liner. The ocean liners are luxurious. They're about glamour. Uh, and he wants to kind of package that into um, the airport terminal that's built. Um, <clears throat> the important thing to note as well is it's obviously we now live in an age of kind of high security um, that you can't just go wandering around airport buildings willy-nilly. The security gates, uh, you can't get outside until you're boarding the plane, etc. Fitzgerald understood back in the late 30s, early 40s that flying was a spectacle. This was big news. Even if you didn't go yourself, you'd want to see what it was all about. Um, which means these, he has on either end of the building huge viewing platforms, uh, and this will become a thing in the 40s and 50s, the day out to the airport to watch the planes. Um, the problem is, again, timing. Ireland's timing in relationship to aviation is always pretty bad. Um, not their fault the war started, but obviously once the war starts, Aer Lingus' routes are all into the UK, uh, there's a war going on over the skies of the UK. Um, so pretty much most flights are either suspended or completely truncated. And actually during the war, um, during the emergency, to use its proper term, um, the airports have to use for growing of crops. So three of the four, four runways are ploughed up um, and there's an annual croppage um, produced at the airport. But the key thing is, um, after the war, after the war, Bizarrely, having made this step to build the airport um, just as the war started, uh, the, the, officially the airport opens on the 19th of January 1940, so the war's in full flow by then. Um, it means that once the war ends, Dublin is ready to go. And what is striking about the way in which the airport, and particularly Fitzgerald's building, are marketed, goes back to the earlier point in the introduction, uh, about the aesthetics of design, the fashion. Dublin Airport is the fashionable place of the 1950s. Um, it's not just in the luxury of travel. But again, if you go back and read the Irish Times, the Irish Independent, the Irish Press, for the period of the late 1940s into the 1950s, the restaurant and the cocktail bar in Dublin Airport are regularly listed as the two places to be seen. This is the place to go. Even if you're not then going somewhere on a plane, um, this is your big night out because it's where the best chefs are, it's where the best cocktails are made, it's where I suppose now we think, you know, the in-crowd in crowd hang out. Um, so it becomes a significant space for dreams. Dreams of kind of luxury, dreams of glamour, dreams of possibility. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's interesting that, you know, I think when we travel, even for all the kind of low-cost airport idea, travelling is still about possibility. And I think it's still, we still hanker after the idea that it's somehow glamorous. Um, but during the sort of 40s and 50s, uh, it very much was. Again, I could do a whole talk just on the design aesthetics of the Ellinger's posters. Um, they produced around 450 of them um, from the 19, late 1940s through to the 1980s. Um, and they're just stunning, again, for depictions not only of Ireland and Irishness, but critically the airport, air travel, and luxury. Um, absolutely beautiful things. Only one of them there. But again, it's the interesting thing is it's a beautiful chrome of the plane. It's not just any car, it's a Rolls Royce. Uh, these are the kind of people who can travel. Um, the reality is, how glamorous is it? Um, by the late 1940s, um, Dublin Airport goes directly to Paris, Manchester, the ever glamorous Glasgow, Brussels, Shannon and Rome. And Shannon is the key one. Ireland, or the Irish state, had been very smart at the end of the war, um, the end of the war in Europe in 1944. It hosted one of the first big gatherings for um, the international aviation industry and its government representations. And it managed to broker a whole series of deals about, without getting into technical detail, 
who had the right to travel from A to B and then on to C? Um, and what Ireland managed to broker, which given, you know, Ireland's neutrality wasn't popular, for example, uh, Ireland was not a big player, Ireland was a small country, it managed to get signed an international agreement that all transatlantic flights leaving Europe that would fly over air, Irish airspace, i.e. most of them, would have to stop at Shannon. Okay? Now this is critical in terms of, okay, most of these planes need a refuel anyway, so it helps, they've got to go there. Um, but imagine you can do that, you can almost have a monopoly on everything going east-west, has to come through Ireland. Um, it's obviously the birth of the duty-free area. Um, but then critically, there's also a side deal, which is an Irish-UK agreement between Aer Lingus and what will become British Airways, which says that Aer Lingus will have the sole right to go from Shannon to the UK, and then have reciprocal rights to go from the UK into any European destination. Which means for most airlines, <coughs> the big American ones, the big British ones, etc., etc., who are trying to get across the Atlantic, they're going Shannon, Boston, New York, etc., etc. Aer Lingus goes Shannon, Dublin, and on, uh, and is sucking huge amounts, huge volumes of passengers off transatlantic flights, hopping them across Ireland and into Europe. And this is where Dublin Airport, although Aer Lingus are late to the transatlantic game, Dublin Airport really, really benefits uh, in terms of building huge capacity very, very quickly because it's key to the transatlantic route. <coughs> now, in 1948, Aer Lingus was so keen on getting in the actual transatlantic route, uh, they've gone out and bought 12 brand new shiny Boeing planes um, to start flying across the transatlantic Dublin, Shannon, and on. Um, but obviously in 1948, there's a change of government. Finn Foyle finally leaves office. Sean Lamass leaves office. Um, and John Costello's government is not keen on, well, either spending money they're not keen on, but they're certainly not keen on aviation. They think that the um, transatlantic route is going to be a huge risk for Aer Lingus, that they might lose money, and the 12 Boeing planes are just instantly sold on. They never arrive in this country, they're, they're pushed out to other countries who want them. Even at that point, Shannon Airport is the busiest airport in Dublin, in Ireland rather, uh, and it's running 24 hours a day. Um, and in a way, while Dublin Airport develops its, its role as a European hub, that missing piece, particularly with Aer Lingus and the transatlantic route, means that transatlantic planes are not coming through Dublin. Government changes again in 1957, Lamas is back, um, and sure enough, in, on the 28th of April 1958, the first inaugural flight, um, Dublin, Shannon, Boston, New York, um, begins. It's 24 hours late, there's a snowstorm in Canada where they stop for refueling and they get stuck. In a way, Lamas and co have proved right that in the end of the first year, um, Aer Lingus have flown 14,700 passengers from Dublin to Shannon and on um, to North America. And it really does prove the kind of value of what anybody in the airline industry will talk to you about is interconnectivity. That you can't just say, I'm going to fly Dublin, Paris, and that's it. It's got to go on somewhere else. There's always going to be ripples. And for Ireland, the transatlantic thing is always, it's not a ripple, it's a wave. Okay? Um, the problem with the growth of numbers is Dublin Airport isn't big enough very, very quickly. At the time when Fitzgerald built um, his beautiful terminal, uh, there were complaints that it was too big. And yet by uh, the end of 1945, Dublin Airport's put through 21,000 people. Perfect for Fitzgerald's building. By 1960, that number's grown to over 600,000. Fitzgerald Terminal can't cope, and you get a very sort of rapid series of buildings put up. Uh, I have to be honest, the rather ugly North Terminal, also known as the Lord's Terminal, because it did a lot of the traffic for um, people going up to Lord's. Um, but it's a sign of the growth that Dublin Airport has to modernise, has to rebuild, uh, and there's various additions along the way. Uh, Pier A, uh, it's built specifically just, again, because of the changes in airline technology. Planes have got bigger, they're higher. Um, you know, you don't really want people walking down 
uh, onto the tarmac and into the building. These are designed specifically for planes to pull up um, alongside. The rate of growth is so fast, um, I said to you, by the end of 1960, 600,000 um, passengers. By 1969, so within a decade, that's as high as 1.7 million passengers a year going through Dublin Airport. You know, huge growth. Um, and it's not good enough just to keep adding bits. So the decision was made um, in 1969 to start building what we now know as Terminal 1, or in modern terms, where Ryanair leaves from, not Aer Lingus. Um, at the bargain price, when I looked at the figures and checked them, £10 million pounds. seems so cheap now. Um, and again, it's, it's about capacity building. It was projected when this was built, it finally opened in June 1972, that it was going to handle 6 million passengers a year. Yeah, bigger than the Irish population. A huge advancement. Uh, and it's built on a scale specifically for big old-fashioned jumbo jets. Um, because the one thing that's happened in these years, I'll explain in a minute why it happened, but Dublin is being used for more and more transatlantic travel. It is, I'll be honest, it's an ugly building, sorry. Um, it's utilitarian, it is generic 1960s, 1970s airport architecture, but flying has changed. One of the reasons that the numbers have gone up so high to 1.7 million passengers in Dublin Airport by the end of 1969 is prices are going down, frequencies going up, um, household um, income is rising. But flying has stopped being so glamorous and has become uh, something that is practical, something that most people do. Uh, it's the advent of all those other issues like the package holidays, etc, etc. So the airport has to cope with huge volume. Um, quick turnaround times as the airport industry becomes more and more um, efficiency. Um, and obviously if you think this is Pier A now, which is where uh, some of the small operators like Flybe and so go from, the idea that you're you're constructing extra bits to um, the airport, which can cope with huge transatlantic planes and then very small um, regional flyers. And I think the key point here is this is this real tipping point. I think Terminal 1 in its kind of utilitarian architecture does speak to um, the more democratic nature of flying, but it isn't all luxury anymore, it's no longer elitist. Into the 80s and 90s, things start changing very, very dramatically. First of all, some of you might remember these. They were very uncomfortable and noisy, and I never liked them. Um, was the advent of the Aer Lingus um, commuter service. Meant that as well as Aer Lingus and others dealing with the transatlantic route, um, the UK and the European route, it was that real moment where the Irish regional airports, um, Galway, Waterford, etc., etc., um, and in part, because obviously with, back then with free motorways in Ireland, um, flying becomes the quickest way of getting literally from east, west, north, south, etc, etc. Um, and it helps, again, grow the airport, so that by the end of 1989, passenger numbers are up to 5.1 million. I suppose a big game changer in aviation, um, in so many ways, and probably labour relations in the next few months. Um, <laughs> was the advent of our friends at Ryanair. Um, and they're, they're really, their stated aim was to break this kind of duopoly that British Airways and Aer Lingus had on the Dublin UK routes. Um, it comes at a time of opportunity in terms of the EU begins to deregulate the airport or the aviation industry so that national airlines, which were always, they were almost monopolies in each country, um, are completely broken down and then under Margaret Thatcher, the same process of UK deregulation begins, which means that Aer Lingus nor British Airways can stop Ryanair. They don't get a license, they can't stop them. Um, so you then get into that whole period um, of the drive to low cost, extra competitors, etc. The success of Ryanair alone, um, just in its first year, it puts an 82,000 customers through Dublin Airport. So, you know, again, another leap. By the end of its first 10 years, Ryanair alone, again, is putting 2.25 million customers through Dublin Airport. So again, it's this next step towards this kind of um, democratisation of flying, the availability of flying, 
uh, and the relative low cost of flying, which becomes important. Now, the one thing that benefits Dublin Airport in recent decades um, is really the kind of destruction, I suppose, of Shannon Airport. Um, I always quite like the layover in Shannon Airport. I always thought something quite romantic about it. That's just a mad, mad romantic fool. Um, in 1993, the Irish government, um, with the Americans and others, um, renewed the international agreements. It was called the Bilateral Air Transport Agreement. Um, one thing I did find, that all regulations around aviation have the most boring titles. They're really kind of corporate speak. Anyway, what it meant was that rather than every flight going across Irish airspace landing at Shannon, only half of them would have to. Um, and since 1993... Um, sorry, in 1993, and since 2008, nothing has to stop at Shannon. You can choose to do it, but you don't have to do it. Which means that since the early 90s, all the growth and development and investment into um, airports in Dublin by the state and by others has really, really focused on Dublin. If you walk into Dublin Airport now, which have a terminal, it's all shiny and new. If you walk around Shannon, it looks very sad. It looks like something that is decaying and falling apart and has not been renewed in 20, 30 years. So Dublin became, becomes the hub. Uh, in 2007, we had the construction of Pier D. Um, again, it's, it's the Ryanair one. The one thing I did like, if you, you've probably all been there, the bridge you have to walk across to get to Pier D because it's halfway to Dun Leary. Um, <coughs> It really opened up for the first time when you're in the airport a vista of the original terminal. Before PAD, the original terminal was kind of lost uh, and you didn't get a, a, a good view of it, whereas I think they've done actually a very good job of bringing it back to life and connecting the old with the new. Um, the growth again was such that in 2010, uh, Terminal 2, otherwise known as the Aer Lingus Terminal, um, is opened. Uh, again, ter Terminal 1, £10 million. Pounds. Terminal 2, at the depths of a recession, £600 million. Pounds. Um, referred to by one journalist when it was opened, given that Ireland's um, economic sovereignty had disappeared by that point, as the biggest white elephant the state has ever built. Uh, I think, fortunately for the airport, that's been proved wrong. Um, but again, future-proofing. Um, it was built with a view that it could handle 15 million passengers a year. Um, it's already just about topped out that number uh, in less than sorry, seven years. Um, the key thing in terms of the boom for the airport generally has been this strange Irish-American relationship, which meant that uh, Southland Shannon in 1986 and then moved to Dublin as well, is the whole issue of US free clearance, the idea that you can get through you can enter America, as it were, while you're still in the airport. And obviously with the building of Terminal 2, again, if those of you have been there, this is a specific area underneath the um, airport where you go through um, Homeland Security, etc., etc. And the knock-on of that has been, not only is it very easy, I go back and forth to the States all the time, it's not only very easy, and you don't do the queue in the other end, um, but if you're flying from elsewhere in Europe, you are going to save hours by going through Dublin. Um, you can hop change planes in Dublin across a couple of hours. I read the other week, the average wait now at San Francisco Airport at peak arrival time of transatlantic flights is three hours, if you come from London or somewhere. So you can see why you know people making decisions about their time and their money um, to saunter around Dublin and have a pint for an hour and then enter America uh, makes perfect sense. So what are we talking about now in 2017? Um, Dublin Airport serves 59 airlines, passenger airlines, 7 freight air, um, airlines. It flies to the US, Canada, the Middle East, the European Union, the UK. Uh, it's the 22nd busiest airport in the world. And the other day when I was kind of, I thought, well, not bad. When you actually looked at the 21 ahead of um, Ireland, I think all of them outstrip Ireland in population terms by a sort of 6, 8, 10 times. The island as a very, very tiny nation should be nowhere near the top 50, let alone the top 20. Um, and it's the 14th busiest airport in um, the European Union. 
And I think the idea of how Ireland kind of and Dublin Airport particularly works as this place for flying um, is that in terms of GDP, Ireland, despite being a very tiny place, actually has per head of population the fourth highest rate of flying in the world. I appreciate that not all Irish people are flying, but I mean, it just gives a sense of how busy uh, and how important Dublin Airport is. And even the big route um, for Dublin Airport is still um, Dublin, London, um, with, where are we now, four different London airports, four or five different airlines doing it. Uh, it's the fourth busiest air airline route anywhere in the world, Dublin, London. Yeah, if you think about that, I know for us it's only a quick 50 minute hop and you can barely drink your cup of coffee because it doesn't cool down quick enough. But that kind of power of connectivity to a major city is hugely important. Um, the airport, again, I sometimes wander through the airport and I'm always fascinated by what it must be like to work in an airport. These places that open at four in the morning and shut at midnight and all kind of weird shift hours, etc, etc. 15,500 people work at Dublin Airport. I don't mean in catering units off the site, I mean in the airport. Um, the airport alone contributes 1.3 billion euro to the Irish economy every year. Um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a place we all think we just rush through, whereas actually it's a huge commercial enterprise. Um, last year, 27 million people went through Dublin Airport, and by the end of this year, that number would have risen to 30 million, um, which is incredible. It's, you know, island population, if we stretch it, of the island is around 5 million. Six times the population of the country go through you know, one relatively small building or set of buildings um, just outside the city. The busiest routes, London first, Manchester, Amsterdam, Paris and New York. Yeah. Huge. Anyway, I just want to end up and wrap up for a couple of minutes on... They're the facts and figures, if you like. What is the value or what is the importance of airports? And I was thinking about this and I thought, oh, there must be a lovely... Some Irish poet must have written an air, a poem about Dublin Airport, not that I could find. Um, airline or aviation artwork is pretty grim. Um, it's one place that brings us all possibility, but culturally I don't think sometimes we, we just take them for granted. Um, they're about people. They're about famous people. The Dublin airport's had its great moments, JFK, 1963, the Beatles, 1966, um, Pope John Paul, 1979, uh, Obama, 2011. I thought it was very interesting when the Queen came here the same year, a few days before Obama, um, she went to, very old school, she went to um, Baldonnell, not to Dublin airport, but more secure, I suppose. Um, but why do we go to airports? What is it? What is this thing? Um, that produces this money and employs these people. What's the relationship most of us have with them? Um, it's one thing, question I always ask myself when I wander through an airport, you sit on a plane. Where, why are all these people going to Boston, Birmingham, Paris, you know, wherever I'm going, I've got a good reason. They must have a good reason. What is it? Um, it's holidays. Work, studying, visiting family. Key thing that I didn't really talk about today, but I mean, again, the switch from sea transportation to air transportation. Um, for the Irish, and then since 2004, and EU enlargement of Poles and Latvians and other people, airports are about emigration. Immigration. They're about leaving. They're about coming home. They're oddly human places. And I think in Dublin, in the way Dublin Airport has a sort of special place, and the Irish with its diaspora has a special narrative about using aeroplanes constantly and that idea of coming home. Um, you would have got by my accent now, I'm not Irish. Um, but I know when I talk to Irish friends, I get very excited at various points of the year that so-and-so, their brother, cousin, whoever, who's emigrated, is coming home. And the airport for them then takes on a whole series of resonances it doesn't for me. For me, it's somewhere to schlep through with my bag and go where I'm going. And I think that comes out more acutely in Dublin than anywhere else in the world at Christmas. And if you, can, if you go onto RTE's website, they obviously have their archive section. And I realise, and the same with the newspapers, this is an annual fixture. This is almost as important as Father Christmas himself arriving in the week before is the film crew out at Dublin Airport. Um, probably there's a special last three years, I think, 
Who are you? Where have you come from? Oh, I'm back from Boston to see my mammy. Ah, ah. And I thought, well, I can't remember that from Britain. And I started playing around with various different countries and realised this is a unique happening in terms of size, scale, and also in the way it's presented by the media um, in Ireland. And I do think it, it, it brings a sort of significance to Dublin Airport that doesn't perhaps exist elsewhere. But yes, you've all left and you've all arrived, but for a lot of Irish people, that has been a very emotional and critical moment where they have either left or their family have left. But this isn't just about getting your shorts into a bag and going to Spain for a week. This is life-changing stuff happens in these various kind of you know, functional buildings out at the airport. Obviously, given its size now, um, it took me about five minutes when I was playing around with this to realise this tiny building here is the original terminal. So from this tiny thing that um, Desmond Fitzgerald built, we now have this huge complex. Um, and I want to end with, I did actually find an American writer who thought about Air Force and what they mean. And I read this and I thought, yes, this works for me and for the kind of wider ramifications of Ireland, Irishness, Diaspora, and this place, this place, Dublin Airport. We love Air Force because they're impermanent. They leave us effectively nowhere. We haven't got to where we're going, and we haven't yet, until we walk through its doors, got home. And inside of them, we are impermanent people. We're no longer students or waiters or accountants in the airport. We're not husbands, daughters or wives. We are whoever we want to be, while we're suspended between one place and the other. We're travellers, we're nomads, we're businessmen. We're going far, far away or we're coming home. And I think that that's very powerful, I think, for Dublin Airport, the idea of how it has been linked um, as a site of kind of emigration and immigration. The way that... I, we've all watched people do it. I watched it on a lot of American flights. The heart-rendering moment when the child, like a child, kid in their 20s is leaving home, is going to somewhere else. There is a tears, the hugs, the mammy breaks down and thrust a fruitcake into an unwilling child's hands, whatever it may be. Uh, the father gives him the nice pat on the back and doesn't shed a tear but balls his eyes out as soon as he gets outside. That's the moment of family fracture and that is the moment of emigration. Ten minutes later when you've gone through security you see the same kid with their backpack, their bag. They're in that impermanent state because they've left. They haven't gone anywhere yet, but the, the airport, the departure gate, is the place of leaving. Thank you.